Jace, how are you, mate? Good to see you virtually, as uh, as all things seem to be at the moment. Are you well? Yeah, really good, mate. Just had uh, I'm based out in in East Lothian, as you know, in North Berwick. We've actually changed scenery. We went up up the tune to Edinburgh for the last couple of nights. Grabbed an Airbnb, ah. um, so changed scenery, which was great. But I tell you, it was quite, quite spooky as to how quiet Edinburgh was. So the Royal Mile was just about deserted. Yeah. Trying to find places for lunch, and then we ended, we ended up couldn't find someone in a sandwich shop. And the fellow only had picked something out on the menu, and he's like, "Sorry, I'm not stocking it today." And he literally had about ten sandwiches in his in his like his big fridge. And he's like, "That's all." It's so quiet. So it really did sort of hit home for the first time because in North Berwick, we've actually had a ton of people coming down. I think it must be that maybe the Glasgow holidays the last couple of weeks. So North Berwick's had a ton of people come down, yeah. whereas Edinburgh was just really quiet. Yeah, well, as you know, I'm Long Nidri, so I, I go into town for work. So I'm Brunsfield all the time, and with properties and shooting in and out of the city centre, it is weird. It's, I'm still getting used to all the face masks, the queues. Queues outside the banks are just unbelievable, you know. There's so many people who just mustn't have online banking or be prepared or not even thinking of going down. That, is that too futuristic for them to go on online banking? They're, they're just, what they're prepared to do to stand outside in the rain it's just weird to see, you know, how... how the, the yeah, it's, it's, isn't it, as you say, this new normal, it's going to take a bit of getting used to, and it does certainly seem like it's all, yeah, it's a bit like, it's a bit like a dream. It's yeah. we're, in a, we're in a dream and what's going on. <laughs> when, are we gonna, when, when are we going to wake up? But that's interesting that you had a holiday in town. Is that the first time you've ever done that, sort of? Oh, well, yeah, the thing, Edinburgh's so beautiful, and we've um, we moved back from France what were we seven years ago and you never actually get in so we ended up we'd hoped to go to the camera obscura but we were a bit slow on, on getting online to book tickets so we did the open top bus tour nice. uh, yesterday when the weather was was wasn't great so we ended up on the, the top deck where the first half is sort of covered and the second half's open so i was up with bev and, and uh, two of our girls were under cover another two were wanting to sit back out in the rain yeah. um, which is grand and Edinburgh's Edinburgh, got it's beautiful so going around and just finding out about the history of, of the city. Yeah, it's something, I mean, I've, there's so, so many things that I probably haven't done. I lived in Edinburgh so, oh, 33 years before we moved out here, lived in the city centre, and there will be so many things I've never done. And I know folk that have never been to the castle, I know folk that have never been up Arthur's Seat, all sorts of stuff, and they've lived in the city all their lives. So yeah, nice it's stuff. on our doorstep, isn't it? And yeah. you take, yeah, you take it for granted a little bit. You don't appreciate it. And obviously a, a newborn in the house, how's everything going up to four now? Yes, it's going really well. Uh, little baby Grace is, yes, our fourth daughter. Um, I was told by her, I don't know who it was, boys make boys and men make girls. That right? You've said that to me before. <laughs> That's, I'll, I'll keep saying that line. Um, going really well, yes. Yeah, so Grace was born on the 9th of March, so just before, so COVID must have been around. Um, but thankfully I was able to be there for the, for the birth with, with my wife, Bev. Mm -hmm. So Grace was born on the 9th of March. Um, so, so like, I guess like everybody else went into lockdown, I think Bev probably had in her heads having maternity leave of just her and Grace and everybody else being out of the house. So mm. that was that was flipped in its head. So it's actually, it's, it's obviously had its challenges, but we've, as a family, so Grace, three, her three big sisters have just loved having her around the house and she's been absolutely doted on. And it's been a different experience rather than having the three, the three youngsters, I think, I think we were three under three at, at one point with them to now having the girls who can now pick up and yeah. hold her and carry her and yeah she's absolutely doted on she sleeps she's I need to get my months right because it all has gone by so quickly she's coming up for five months on the 9th of august and she's been sleeping through probably for about six weeks already so yeah. we're big on routine routine seems to work for the kids and keep her well fed that's it. Well, when I'm at three, I've got a girl, boy, boy, and we can, we, we've tapped out at three, Abby and I, but a fourth, I mean, yeah, good on you, because cause three sometimes just, I think, Jesus, well, there's always one around, you know, <laughs> there's always one around. Yeah, there's always something to go on, and we probably would have, we would have considered having had a fourth on that sort of natural two-year progression, but our second youngest, May, was, was really poorly um, when she was... What was she when she was four and that sort of just took us sort of out of our stride and we didn't really sort of consider it again and then yeah thing, things happened and it's, it's really sort of changed our whole perspective on the family and it's it's been a really a really positive experience for us so far but yeah. like as you all know with parenting it's 
you get back what you put into it and there's challenges and kids are human beings and they get it wrong sometimes and it's it's probably the hardest job that anyone's ever going to have i think if you if you give it your best shot yeah 100% is it is the hardest job but the most rewarding at the same time it's uh, it's it's fantastic jace how about east lothian living obviously we're both down this way i was out with the boys uh, on Monday night from Ocean Vertical. I was in Dunbar jumping off rocks. I know you've done the co-steering and all that sort of stuff. Do you embrace the, the lifestyle, the sea, the water, the beaches you get out of? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. We ended up, so when we finished up playing rugby in France, we um, sort of retraced our steps as to like, where could we go back and live? So prior to that was Manchester. So we, we looked at that. We looked at Glasgow. We looked at Edinburgh. We looked at Aberdeen. And we couldn't really decide on anywhere. And my parents... Um, I grew up in Aberdeen, but my parents live out in Garveld, out in East Lothian, and they took us out for an ice cream to North Berwick, which was the first time I'd ever been. And we came back and the sun was shining and Beverly always seems to have a, a habit of picking quite expensive places to live. <laughs> but, so it's brilliant. And the fact we've loved having this really great community. And as I mentioned, when, when May was poorly and um, it was in the World Cup in 2015, the community really rallied around May. And, um, and, and she's totally fine now, but it, it was really amazing to be part of a community and, and that's what I love about it. And you've got the, the beaches on your doorstep, you can get up the law um, and, and you're not too far away from anything. So I do, yeah, I like getting out on the beach. I like doing a bit of stand up paddle boarding, trying to get out with the, with the kids and getting out with uh, Adrian and Stevie and, and just trying to be, trying to be healthy, I think is, is key, have a bit of balance. Exactly. What about when you were playing? Obviously, it's not like jumping off rocks and co-steering and things like that, but skiing's a bit of a no-no and all these sort of adventure sports and um, wild things that you can do while you're contracted. Has there been anything you've done since you've um, retired as a player that you've sort of had a bit of a release and been able, I can do that now? Up snowboarding. So I, uh, I had uh, dicky knees. So I ended up doing my cruciate on my right knee and I had a bad break on my, I had a spiral fracture on my tib and broke my fib on my left leg. So I try and, I don't like skiing with the way that you can sort of twist your knees in the way. So I did a bit of, I was a bit of a dodgy skateboarder growing up. So I can, um, so I had a go on my very first Christmas after finishing uh, playing rugby in France, I went out with a, with some of the boys who were still playing and, and gave snowboarding a go and picked it up straight away. So if I can, I try and get out snowboarding each winter. We didn't manage to get away uh, this winter. So I picked up snowboarding again, which I, and I probably won't do skiing just because of the nick of my knees and not wanting to yeah, sort of, sort of risk it there. I've given, done rowing, give rowing a little bit of a go. Um, Sea rowing out in North Berwick, which is right. which is which was good. You got in a thing called a skiff, yeah. and I got sort of sucked into that, which was good. And I really, you've got the frame for the rowing, have you not? The the long yeah, levers and all that qu sort of stuff. Quite long levers. Yeah. Um, it's good. Like it's been part of a team. So you've got to the first time I'm out in a boat, it was um, so there's four people rowing and there's the what's it called the there we go shows how much I know the chap who keeps you in time cool. who keeps you safe the cox yeah and the chap who keeps you keeps you safe and everything and I first went out with probably two women in their in their 50s and a chap who was older than me and it didn't matter at all but you've got to work together and you've got to row in time and the fact that I was potentially pulling a little bit harder than them didn't didn't matter at all yeah. um, so, so I enjoyed that I had one go at the at the big meets when they go there and my very first uh, I was entered in the mixed, I think, over 30s race. And out in North Berwick, there's the sort of little starter's hut and it goes across to one of the rocks and you have to try and get in a try and get in a straight line. And the chap's over in the tannoy and you have to come back. And he's, he goes, I think it's oars in the water and then go. And we had a couple of false starts. And on the very first one, I think it was oars in the water and I gave it absolutely loudly. And on about the second stroke, the, uh, the oars snapped. <laughs> no idea. So, 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 game over. <laughs> that was game over. So that was that was back into the uh, the shoreline. So I managed. So I've kept the oar as a bit of a memento for my my first ever row. And I then took part in the like the men's open, which is from that start line round Craig Leithen back. Yep. And it's about sixteen or seventeen minutes. And I was you're absolutely burst because you're you have to go in time with the you go in time with the crew and you ha and you give it absolutely loudly. And I yeah. was. I call it catching a crab and stuff when you're when you're coming around. But it's but it's brilliant because it's you're working as a team and you're working towards something. Are you familiar with the term a micro adventure? Not really. When you nope. go out, when you you go on a, you sort of start 
the traditional sort of working day nine to five and a micro adventure is trying to just get the adventure between 5 p.m and 9 a.m so me and stevie boyle about a year ago from ocean vertical we met at north berwick harbour on the paddle boards we paddle boarded out this was maybe about 6 p.m 7 p.m paddle boarded out after fish and chips obviously um <laughs> to, to go and camp for the night on craigleith island now we went round the left of the island and the, the waves were pretty big. Stevie was standing. Um, I was on my knees because I'm not as confident on the board as Stevie is in those conditions. We got around the left-hand side of it. There were seals basking and we just couldn't get to the rock. So the option was we go back in or we try and get to another island. So we ended up on Lamb Island. You know where Lamb oh, Island brilliant. is? Yeah, we, yeah. we hightailed it across there, dragged the paddle boards on and found an a empty bit of grass. But the, the bird life, the birds, up all night. But Stevie and I, two sleeping bags, a couple of cans, a couple of energy bars, stayed the night, up at 4 a.m. the next morning. And with sunset coming up, we just uh, went back to North Berwick. I was home for breakfast with the kids and at work on time. The micro adventure. So things awesome. Like, I think we're yeah, it does sound That does sound cool. And I love that. I love going out to, to Craigleith and, and just like to see puffins or seals yeah. or, or to see stuff. It just, your headspace goes completely for, yeah. for that for however long you're out, that hour, hour and a half. Yeah, and you can do it just about. Your oldest maybe go to bed later. All my kids will be a bit in bed about seven. So you could leave it. You've actually got seven. a bit of adult time, don't you? Perfect. Adult time. Kids are yeah. sleeping. You can be back before they're awake in the morning. And you've, you've maybe been up all night, and you've maybe been doing, but you're living. You know, instead of that lifestyle of hitting the sofa or, oh, oh God, I've done a hard day's work. No, no, there, there's more time for me to go out and do stuff here. We, we're all about that here. We love the, the East Lothian lifestyle that, we just if it's lighting fires, if it's jumping in the sea, if it's running miles, whatever it is, it's just getting out and enjoying it. You know, it's just doing what you can as often as you can to just put the put the hours in. It's fantastic. Yeah, I agree. I'm not spoiling here. What about um the body? How is the body? You say your knees, but you put in uh, a fair shift throughout your career. Is there anything? Yeah, I th I th I'm not too bad. My um my knees. If I do a load of ton of work in the garden, my back gets a little bit sore. But I'm, I'm quite lucky that I've, like body shape wise, I've probably become quite normal. I, um, I've lost probably all the extra excess muscle that I had to have on my body when I was, when I was playing just for the, the hits and the bumps and bruises. So I think that's definitely helped. I think my natural body shape, mum and dad are, are naturally lean. So I think my sort of go-to type, I'm your tall skinny chap. Um, so that's probably helped me. And, and, and you know what, I guess the one thing which if, if there's ever anything which I may be apprehensive about, we'd probably be had a little bit of a disregard for playing on and I probably had a couple of bumps in the head where reflecting back maybe should have come off. So I'm sort of skipping back to what's happening in the world nowadays. It's, it's so good that concussion is, is so important um, and that if in doubt sit it out from uh, Peter Robinson after his, his son Ben unfortunately died after playing on with a, a couple of bumps and bruises is that'll be the one thing where I'm not tempting fate but looking ahead I just really hope that things stay healthy in, in that regard. Well you played in an era where I mean, you see guys sitting in the stand now and if they say they've got concussion like you said there it's respected we understand that now but you'll have been in an era with a banged head and dizzy and whatever's going on and if people can't physically see a stooky or crutches they think there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah, and it's it's just it's just about impossible to to put the player in that position because you just want to do everything for your team, and yeah. and it'll take ed education as the I think is the key. It's it's about how you educate the players as to well, no, it's not the right thing to play on because you're you're risking your own health at in that immediate moment and and in the future, and and you're not actually going to help the team because you're not going to be at your best and. I don't know, you'll drop the ball, you'll get the I remember, like, there's, there's some classic stories where I've been or other people as to, I think one where I played against Fiji and I got badly concussed, name a number between one and 10, and I, I said a number in the high 20s or something. You're just, really? you're talking, you're talking rubbish, which just shows. And thankfully, James Robson wheaked me off the, got me off the pitch straight away. Um, but it's just little bits like that. And it's the, I think it's picking up the second bump either within, that same match, which is which can be really dangerous, or picking up a couple of bumps within a short short space of time. I had Dave Denton on the show months ago now, but he openly talks about he still has problems with his vision, still has problems with headaches and all sorts of things. You know, had to change his diet, had to change a lot of things. He, he was a player like you, I mean, run at a brick wall or, or smash whatever's in front of you, but 
he's done some damage. You know, he's done some damage. He's had to step away and he's had to do it for for the sake of him, the sake of his family, his kid. You know, he's had to make that decision. Do you think, uh, you, you don't want to say how bad is it going to get, but do you think they are doing enough at the moment? Do you think they're doing enough just to, to keep tabs on everything? Because players will say, no, I'm fine, Doc. You know, I will, I will, I'll stay on. It's, um, I guess it's, it's so hard, isn't it? Because jobs are, jobs are on the line, but there is no job which is not worth somebody's, somebody's health. Yeah. And like, there's some of like George, like some of the stuff with George Norris, seen him oh, going yeah. down and getting whiplash, and and you would say he's it clearly he was, he's unconscious. And then I think you see people playing on, and that's where I think you need somebody. And at the highest level, it's a little bit easier probably. But it's let's not forget there's like all the people, thousands of people who play club rugby ar around the world. You've you've got to educate from the bottom up, and that's where where I'm involved in schoolboy rugby. It's Let's not take chances with anybody's health. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to club rugby. Obviously, we're both um, past Watsonians and we're both um, familiar down at Marseille. Good, good fond memories of Marseille and even getting there um, since you've been playing. I mean, just catching up in the clubhouse and. and, it, and yeah, it, I've, I've only got great things to say about Watsonians. So I grew up in Aberdeen and I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to come down to Watson's just from my last year at school. Yeah. Um, was in the bug hut, which I don't think is anymore. I don't think uh, Watson's runs the, the boarding house anymore. Um, so I had a I had a brilliant just one year at school and, and loved it. Um, some 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 of my best muckers are, are still from there, and I went straight from uh, studying at, at the school to going into sort of a, a club flat. The the treasurer Morris Duncan would pay the rent, um, and I was in with two great Watsonians, Martin McCarry and James McDougall, and. Came down and from leaving school, I played in the Mighty Twos under Stave and Gav Hastings was, I think, played a couple of games. I don't know if Gav came to the Twos or went further down, but there was, like, there were Scotland players in there. So from coming out from school to to rubbing shoulders with, like Tom Grimesy, uh, Rob Wainwright. So so it's amazing. And yeah. we then went on and we won the, the Scottish Premiership. I think it was ninety seven. Down in the down in the green yard. So, oh yeah, Nash, I absolutely loved Watsonians, and it's got a proper club feel, and and that's where you learn about it. Like the, I think we played Strathendrick away, and like wine and cheese and port on the bus coming back and stuff, and that and that's what that's what's brilliant about rugby is is those moments and and those times you have together with, and and it's a moment in time, and it's not for. Like it's not for me at the moment, but at that point in my life, I, I couldn't have had more fun. Oh, that's it. I, I talk about that all the time. My, my relationship with alcohol has completely changed of what we used to all do on the bus and, and the, the good times and straight out, win, lose or draw, you, you'd go and enjoy it. But that was the culture and that's how good Meyerside was. But that's how good Megatland was and Golden Acre was and wherever you were, that was the thing. You're going out with the boys. And sometimes you would sneak in a, a cheeky night out after Tuesday training. It's an amateur game. You're allowed to do that if you're if you're in um, early days of university or things like that. But God, it was it was good. I remember some great times at, at my side, and hopefully the clubhouse obviously had the fire recently. Hopefully it recovered. yeah. Hopefully it comes back in, in better shape, isn't it? I've not actually I've not heard. Um, I think it's been quite slow, obviously through COVID and lockdown. Yeah, COVID won't have helped at all. Will it? Used to getting the club back up and. Um, and back to, to the good old ways because it was just fantastic. But now, obviously, are you still connected to North Berwick? Do you still do anything with the, the club there? Or No, I don't, I don't have time. So when I came back from France, I Keith Keith Waters, who's who was one of my big buds from school, yeah. he was, I think he was president at the time, and I think Marcus was, Marcus Drollo, we were all in the, in the same year at school. Yeah. I think they were involved. So Keith, I had a blender with Keith. So I coached the Watsonians for a couple of years, um, which was brilliant. I uh, really enjoyed that, but it was actually, I found it was actually taking me away from North Berwick after I was working in the centre of Edinburgh and I was zipping up to Myerside and zipping home and then going to the Tuesday, Thursday games on a Saturday. I wasn't actually in North Berwick and taking part in the community here. So I, I had to sort of pull away from there and then coached at North Berwick for a couple of years, which was brilliant to get to know the people here. And then again, just getting that work-life balance between how much time you're you got your work, then you got your family, and then bolting on coaching a, a rugby club as well. One of the hardest things I find is that, like, to do something properly takes a big commitment, and I probably wasn't able to. For the same for Watsonians, the same for North Berwick, I wasn't able to do it probably quite as much as I wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I still try and get down and 
support the boys in the clubhouse. North Berwick's got a great history and tradition of unearthing some great talents um, and probably down to the fact they've got such a strong, vibrant mini section where rugby just grows in the, in the town. Yeah. Jace, I wrote a blog and I actually just put it out today and it was about um, when we find these sort of gem of a player or any kind of player coming through the ranks. You've obviously seen it and you, you work in school rugby now. You've obviously seen it in North Berwick, at Watsonians and you've been a young player with potential. You know, and you got that opportunity and scholarship. What happened to you or who did someone take you under your wing that kept you on the straight and narrow, that kept you away from distraction to say that, look, you could go all the way here. You, you could captain Scotland, you know, you could be a lion and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think that probably, you know, I saw my dad, so I grew up in Aberdeen. My dad was in the car trade and he had a, so dad would work Monday to Monday to Friday and then always every Saturday morning. And I guess I probably just saw a work ethic from him yeah. and I, I was probably big physically compared to everyone as a schoolboy. And then when I then transferred probably through to Watsonians, I suddenly learned that, well, I was, I was big, but I wasn't any bigger than Stuart Grimes or Wainwright. And it was actually that work ethic, which I'd probably learned growing up in Aberdeen. I did um, tatty picking up in Aberdeen. I don't think they did it there any slow. And I'd go out in the, in the October holidays and pick tatties, newspaper rounds, dishwasher in three or four of the local restaurants. There was a car cleaner and stuff. And I just had a bit of a work ethic, which I think I got from my dad. And I realized that if you want something, you've got to work hard for it and put in the effort. And I think I was able to apply that to my rugby career. And in terms of, was there anybody in particular who's probably kept me on the, on the straight and narrow? I think probably just the environment and having good people. When I left school, I went into the flat with Martin McCarry and, and James McDougall, who were a good bit older. Martin was a policeman and James were a lawyer, and they probably put their arm around me a little bit and just made sure I stayed relatively on the straight and narrow with, within certain parameters. That's a good, uh, a good flatmates to have, a policeman and a lawyer when you're a young guy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> not bad. <laughs> just in case you need them. <laughs> That's good. Well, obviously, I, mean, I knew Martin so well as well. Do um, you want to give us just a wee update on his charity? We obviously lost him at such a, a young age and it was tragic and just an absolute... Yeah, so, yeah so, so so Martin was brilliant and he was all about... He just loved sport and I don't know what he's... So many games for Watsonian at cricket, played Watsonians at squash and he um, played at rugby as well. I remember we went down on a, on a tour to London Scottish and Martin was, he was sort of floating around the first and the seconds. And I went down and I was asked, I think it was, I think it was Andy Kerr, who was the, who was the coach. And he asked me to be the, the captain for the game on the Friday night before going to international. And Martin just about, Martin didn't drink. So he just yeah. about dropped his pint of orange juice when he was told that I was going to be the, the captain of Watsonians at probably 18 or 19. Um, and it was, yeah, life's just not fair sometimes. And for Martin to to not be with us just really does feel unfair. But I think in the in that bigger picture, Sporting Start is able to to do some good and I think really to honour Martin's name. So it's a charity to try and give kids the opportunity to take part in sport and generally kids around the south of Edinburgh and and the wider Edinburgh that, that opportunity to get into sport. So there's there's a huge Watsonians influence in the in the trustees, Martin's um wife Lucy Anne Ritchie, um, Shug Anderson, James, Graham Bean, uh, Stevie Much, James McDougall. Uh, I'm sure I've missed a couple of people out here, but so there's a huge Watsonians influence. We've had a couple of dinners at Meyer's side. We've done, people have been fantastic doing some fundraising work for them. We've done some work at uh, Lismore Rugby Club down at Spartans for football. I know Watsonian School have done some sort of hockey stuff and it's really just trying to identify some of the kids who just don't have that opportunity, whether it's buying rugby boots or even having breakfast before they go to school. So it's it's just finding a good way of, of honouring Martin and yeah, and having and having a little bit of fun along the way because Martin was for all that he was teetotal, he was the life and soul of the party as well. Well, he was, and he, he got me out of a few scrapes in Marseille Clubhouse saying, Nashi, it's probably time you left, pal. You know, you, you, <laughs> he's the one that was always sober and always watching the young lads. And lad. he could keep an eye on what was going on, couldn't he? he? Always, always keep an eye on the young lads. And he'd be the one that would remember on Tuesday night and we'd just grab you and take you aside and say, Nashi, you need to put that back, that shield back off the wall. You need to put that back. And all that stuff. <laughs> oh, no, Martin, oh, an absolute legend. And it's fantastic that the charity is just continuing his legacy of 
of just enjoying sport and helping as many folk as he can, as it can, because that's what he did. It's, it's tremendous. Jace, t- t- talk us through um, the, the moves. Obviously, Sale, long part of your career at Sale, then off to Claremont. Highlights and players that you remember playing in the back row with or guys that you loved playing against? Yeah, so I left... Um, so I was at Glasgow. I actually did... So I was part of... Grew up in Aberdeen, came to what's known as, and was then affiliated to play for Cali Reds. So I was involved when there was the four districts in Scotland. That was then... So that was then cut to two, so it was Cali Reds. So I had a great time playing in Glasgow, loved it. Um, but I wanted the chance really to sort of test myself on a week-in, week-out basis down in the Premiership. So I went down to Sale. So I remember going down there. So I joined after playing in the 03 World Cup with, uh, with Scotland and got down there. And they ended up, there was the bus company called Ellison's who did the English team bus. And we had Jason. So we had the English team bus, which they'd just done their open top bus parade and then we had Jason Robinson who hadn't just won the World Cup so my and we so Jim Malander and Steve Diamond were the first coaches they then moved on and we had Philippe Santondre um, who, who came in and we, we built a really cracking team there we had um, we had the, the fellas from France who who'd certainly added a, a certain something to the team Chabal Sebastian Bruno um, we had some cracking English players Jason Robinson, Kuwait, uh, Mark Kuwaito, Charlie Hodgson, Andy Sheridan, Andy Titrell. We also had Barry Stewart and Fullerton, other Scots. So there's always a good Scottish connection there. And I just, I really took to the fact that you had to front up every week in the Premiership and you had to play Harlequins one week, then go to Leicester, then go to Gloucester, go to Bath. And so it was, it was really tough rugby every week. And, and I guess throughout my career, the things that I learned were like build a relationship with the coaches because the, you need that. And if you want to go well, you need to be playing. And a basic level of set piece. So be good in your in your lineup, be good in your scrum. And then what can I bring to the team around the pitch? And the obvious thing, which was a sort of natural ability, was was be good in the defensive line, get out the line and hit people as, as hard as you could. Um, we, had a, we had a good time in sale. We won the premiership in 06. So I've yeah, had a lot of good memories of uh, time in Manchester and then on to France where I played in, um, in Clermont. Just, just to keep you at sale there, if, if you're at six and Chabal's at eight, who was usually your open side flanker? So we had a, a young English guy called uh, Magnus Lund oh, yeah. who, played, who, oh. who picked, up, picked up a few caps for, yeah. um, for England who was really good. And then um, we had the Argentinian brothers. We had uh, Ignacio Fernandez Lobby, Nacho Lobby, who played over 70 times for Argentina, and his younger brother, yeah. uh, Corcho, Juan Martin, came. So we had, well, we had, we had, a, we had a proper team there. Yeah. Um, the thing with, uh, with Seabass C- was brilliant, but he was inherently quite a lazy chap. So he would do one amazing big barnstorming run, and then he would he would take about two minutes to get up off his feet and he would then walk around for five minutes and then do something else brilliant. So I think one of the key things for in any back row is having, having the balance. And yeah. Magnus and I had to, we had to graft and we understood that. And if we grafted hard, if the other front five players grafted hard, it allowed, allowed Seabass to sort of do his stuff. But he arrived in, uh, he arrived in Manchester with short hair and a cleanly shaven face. And then one summer, disappeared back to France and came back with shoulder length hair and and his beard which is even longer than yours and he turned into <laughs> global superstar overnight yeah what what what's he doing these days is he coaching or working do you keep in touch or anything? yeah I bumped into him a couple of times I think yeah he's uh he's on the he's on the radio in France he's on the telly and he's a proper superstar over there like he is he was getting oh, flown yeah. around in private jets to to do stuff I think I don't, if he's been careful with his money, he doesn't need to work again, okay. to be honest. What about Jason Robinson? I mean, you must have seen some things on the pitch or even at training that you thought there's no one else who could do that. Maybe Andy Turnbull, fellow Watsonian. He had the sort of speed and dynamism of uh, Jason Robinson. But what, what was he like to be around? Yeah, he was, he was, he's, he's not at the moment, but he was heavily, heavily religious when he was with us at, um, at Sale. So I think he'd had a couple of challenges in his life. Um, when he was playing rugby at Wigan, but he could, his biggest thing is he didn't lose any speed when he was changing direction for his sidestep. And he didn't do any weights because if he did any weights, he would just, he'd, he'd puff up and he would, and he would get too big. But his, like his body, 
his body weight to power ratio was just through the roof. So he was a little chap weighing probably 70 or 80 kilos and he was one of the strongest guys in the gym and big, big time player. And he produced the goods when it mattered. And that was probably the, the best thing about Robo is like big game. He'd get the ball at fullback and he'd, he'd do something and he'd do something big and he'd, he'd make the difference. When, when I had um, Kelly Brown on last week on the show, he was talking about Skulk Burger in the back row for Saracens. And he said some, something similar there, that Skulk Burger never really trained in the gym. You know, didn't have to, but on Saturday he turned up. He would turn up every week, whatever the weather. D- did that ever annoy you that there were some players, if you had to put a shift in constantly, but you knew that someone else maybe didn't have to work as hard in the gym? Or were you just always dependent on what they did on Saturday? No, if they pitched up on the weekend. And I think their, their general attitude to the whole thing. Um, if someone's a bit of a slacker in full stop, then they're not going to thrive and they're, and they're not going to last in they're not going to last in a high performing environment and I saw, I saw it as well probably towards the end of my career as I had a good relationship with the conditioners out in France is that I had, had to be managed with my body mm-hmm. and I wasn't able to do like I couldn't squat or I couldn't deadlift because of my dodgy knees and my dodgy back. So you, so you got managed. And I think you don't have the respect of your teammates if, if you don't put the graft in. And, and, and Robbo, fair play, didn't have to do much work in the gym, but he had the respect of his teammates from the way that he, the way that he played. Yeah. And what about yourself? Obviously, you earned respect early in your career by the, the physicality that you put onto the pitch. Did you just have that from an early age, from just going through that were you always looking for the big hit? Or... Did some people just wrong down the, run down the wrong alley and, and you happen to be there and you, you just your technique was so on point? Yeah, so I just I had a, picked up a knack for it from a young age and I think the biggest thing was just the timing in the tackle and like I didn't start rugby until I was about 13 and I think probably in, probably in the one about the first five games that I played against Mackey, a team from Stonehaven, is I ended up crunching somebody and breaking their ribs. God. And I think of must have had a little bit of strength and to be honest right right the way through and it was just the timing of the tackle and and I was aggressive and I had the mindset of right I'm going to go out there and I'm going to try and do as much damage within the laws and I was never somebody to try and like go for high shots and there's like some of the some people will go in with a swinging arm but I was all about the shoulder contact and I think that was the way to like transfer the power and uh, Alan Tate, who was the defence coach with Scotland for a while, was all about handles and hooking one arm round the probably round the back of back of the person's back and hooking a leg and trying to get them up. But I was just trying to put as much power through the the tackle as you could. Yeah, the way it would lift the game though, and the way it could galvanise your team. I mean, obviously that must have been more to you than scoring tries and things like that. When you when you did that, when you could change the sort of course of an attack or defensive split, the display. How did that make you feel when you got off the ground and that guy's still down there? What, what were you oh, the, you know, I, I loved it, Nash. And, I, yeah. and talking about scoring tries, I didn't score very many. So it was my way of, and I knew it was the way I could influence the team. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, so privileged to, to play at Murrayfield a number of times and to, and to, and to get the crowd on your side. And, and it does, it gives everybody else a lift. And I think sometimes there are moments in games where people either they give you a little bit of hope or they give you something to follow. And, and, I, and I learned, and that was one of the things that I could bring to the team was, was that physicality and follow me. It's like, I'm going to go out and we're going to do this. And, and it didn't always come off. And I'm, I'm sure I gave myself a couple of stingers and I saw stars a couple of times because if you put all your eggs in that one basket, then, then it, can, it can go wrong. There's a late, a late swerve or a little hip check from somebody and it's, it's, it's isn't it it's mass versus mass and sometimes it came off and, and it came off more often than not but it, it didn't always yeah and in, in your I think was it 77 caps for Scotland who's what do you remember as sort of a, the most consistent back row that you played in who was uh, probably me Simon and Hoggy I, I would say there was the there was the period there there was other people who were Andrew Moore was there around a little bit when I first came through Marty Leslie was was a great player when I when I first came through and then Marty probably finished off. Budge Poutney was there for for a couple of years. And I think they were, and they were really important players for me at the start of my career to because you learn from people who've been there and who've who've done it already. So I played with Rob Wainwright a, li- a little bit um, just at the tail end of his career. Tom Smith, 
uh, Grimesy, Scott Murray, Marty Lesd, and, and and you learn a little bit from those players, and you then you have to kick on yourself. But probably me, Simon, and Hoggy played the majority of probably our internationals together. Is Simon one of the most skillful back growers you've played with? Yeah, he 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 did. He changed really, Simon. I, I guess he changed probably over the years as to when he first came through, and I saw the highlights on Twitter when he was. What was the first Lions tour that he went on? Was it one in Australia where he was the Behind the back pass. Behind the back. And he's just like a free running, yeah. literally yeah. gazelle. And that, and the, the way that the, sort of the, the, the cards were dealt to Simon, he unfortunately, I think he had a couple of the cruciate ligament injuries and, and that had to change. And I don't know if it did change the way that, that he played or not, but he certainly became a little bit heavier. And, but he was able to, to be skillful and, and hit it up and he, and he could pass and, he could pass off both hands really well. He could offload, but he could also do the nitty gritty that he that he had to do. And what about Hoggy? Forty nine caps, stopped there. Should have got more. I mean, I know Hoggy and spoke to him many times. That was a shame. I think it, it's really it's really it's really tough, and it's all about having that relationship with your coach and if who the coaches that I had at Geach and 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 Jim Telfer and then Frank and. And it's all about the coach's opinion. And it's, does the coach think you're the right person? It's the same as the, the sports writer who writes up the report about you. You you're, you're need to, to work to build up that relationship with one person and, and put it on. But yeah, 49 has got to sting a little bit for Hoggy. And I'll bet. So take us to France. How, how did that move come around in, in your time at Claremont? Very enjoyable? Yeah, the, um, I think I'd probably just done my time at, at, uh, at Sale. So I went over to France, met Vern Cotter, um, big stern Vern. I remember going to meet him in his house and sat on his one of his bar stools in his kitchen and I managed to snap one of the legs on his... Glad you didn't see his knee. <laughs> no, not, 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 not sit on big Vern's knee. No, so I sat on the bar stool in his kitchen and snapped one of the bar stools, which I remember having some joke with him about, oh, I'll buy a new bar stool if we win the the French Championship, the bouclier de Brunus for the, for the first time. So, I, I, yeah, I loved another... I think a, a challenge there for the family with the lifestyle and everything, mm. the language, and to try and see if I could get into a, to a good French team. Um, so, it, so it started, it was the first six months were, were a mixture of incredibly hard. My wife, Beverly, wasn't happy at all. She'd just coming off maternity leave for her first daughter, Annabelle, wanted to go back to work, but she couldn't mm. due to the language barriers in her line of work as a, as a psychologist. I managed to break into the, the first team, which was brilliant. And I then had a real nasty injury on the, the 1st of January in 2010, which, uh, which was my leg break, um, which, was a, which was a bad one. And then didn't play again for the rest of, the rest of that season. Um, and Claremont went on to win the, the Brunus for the first time in, in their history. So, um, I, it, but, but France was brilliant. I was there when we played... I think we lost one home game in the three years that I played there. And the team went on to, I was there for the start of the, I guess the unbeaten record of 77 games. So every game at home is a sellout and the, the town is awash with yellow. And mm. I think if anybody ever gets the chance to go out to, to Claremont, then then you've got to take it. Um, Jay, that leg break, go, go back to that. Obviously it's, it's well documented now. A lot of players through injury can, can, very difficult mentally. How did you cope with that if things weren't so settled and an early egg, leg break and no rugby and the team win the league? How were you mentally? Were you able to? Yeah, it was, it was really hard. So the, one of the hardest things, and it may just have been lost in translation because it was a spiral fracture on my tib and I did my fib as well. And I was told by the doctor that you'll be back in, I think, he's, I think and how I reflect on it, it was you'll be back in 12 weeks, which I think is a standard leg break. But in 12 weeks, I could still barely walk. Um, so I was like, yeah, there's something not quite right here. And I got a little magnet thing, which they put on the, the point that I'd broken it and I had the doing everything. And one of the hardest things for a pro, pro player is not being able to do what you love. Mm. And on a long-term injury, you end up, you've seen the boys come, who've got a, they're out for a couple of weeks or if they've got a bad one, they've tweaked their hammy and they're out for four weeks. Mm. But I would see them come and they would go and you're working towards something, but I was expecting to be back after 12 weeks. So... Yeah, it was. It was really hard. I tried to tried to stay involved with the team. We'd take part in the team meetings, and and just try and be around there and try and be positive and 
try and control what what you can control. Uh, I know um, we'll get into a little bit of life after rugby. You went and um, got part of the team at Red Sky. Were you involved in, in with you being at Claremont? Obviously, a few players at Red Sky. Greg went to Claremont. Um, Richie, uh, Richie Gray over at Toulouse. Was that advantageous? Obviously, was, was it perfect that you'd had that experience in the French environment to speak to the Scottish players that were looking at France? Yeah, I think it it, it definitely helped, and I think. I so I was one of Red Sky's first ever athletes who who came on board, and you no. Know, so the timings of when I finished, so I finished up. So Red Sky were great for me coming out after rugby, and one of their big things is um, having a double career track. So I when I came back out out of back to France, I worked with an oil company up at Aberdeen called Exodus, who had been an ambassador for. So I did my first year back in Scotland I did part-time with Exodus and part-time with Red Sky and at the end of that first year I had to really decide on which path I was going to go down was I going to go down the oil and gas route and probably end up moving up to Aberdeen or down the sports management side so I probably thankfully in the way the oil industry has gone has went down sports management so at that point Richie I think was already out in France playing at cast um, but I was right. involved in I was involved in Greek. I had a couple of interesting trips with out with Greg to meet some of the French owners, and I was involved when Greg went out and was able to show him some of the sites in Claremont and introduce him to some of the people. Yeah. Um, and and what about working with other athletes? Obviously, Red Sky has got such a, a vast variety. Oh, it's a real it's a real privilege. And I went out to the to the Olympics in 2016 in Rio with um, with Rowan, and we were. They're supporting the athletes and athletes are winning medals. Uh, Callum Skinner there watching David Florence in the in the canoe and it's and it's brilliant. And just to be part of their sort of backstory and try and support them and and you understand all the hard work and the graft that's going into they're chasing their dreams, going up against the very best in the world. And they've all come from a normal background and they've all chased their dreams and they're and they're just they're going hard out for it. And some of them, some of them meddled in those games. Some of them didn't, but they all, they all gave their absolute all for it. And, and were you studying throughout your career, or obviously with with Red Sky and, and knowing Rowan and the guys, was that just a career progression into employment afterwards, or did you have something, a degree or anything to fall back on? So I, so I left Watsons and then went to college, and then went full time with with rugby, and I'd had an H and D at Telford College, and that then allowed me to get onto a sports science degree when I was playing for Glasgow. So yeah. I did, I think I did a couple of years at, at Napier University to get my, so I've got a, a sports science degree. And then I, I did lots of little bits. When I did my, when I was at Sale and I, I did my cruciate, I tried to get in and do some work experience. So there was that period where you've, when you've done your cruciate, you can't really do too much. So I remember doing some work experience with Murray Metals, who were the Scotland sponsor at the time. I went down to a hair care company of all things in London and just tried to get out and and speak to people and find out am I, could this industry be for me and, and just try and speak to people. So I guess one of the one of the great bits of advice you always got from Red Sky was try and be inquisitive. Yeah. And I think just by asking good questions and, and meeting people, and you're very fortunate in in, in real top top level sport, you, you get to speak to some people who can generally open some doors for you if you're able to hold a conversation and and you're interested and you're inquisitive. Then, then it's it's there for you. I've I've always found that it's amazing that people if you if you reach out or someone's does a role or has a job that you'd love to find out more about, quite often if you knock that door or ask politely or get the right introduction, people will give you their time. You know, and so yeah, people will generally they will help you, won't they? Yeah, it's yeah. Just just do it in the correct manner. Yeah. Look look for an introduction and if and if they say no the first time, follow up politely. You know, don't just quit that first time because that person might be the key to the next stage of your career, your life, your opportunity. And it's just about knocking on that door every time. And you know, if if it is slammed shut every time, it's finding the next opportunity. So how did the opportunity at Loreto come around where you are now? How did that um so the, the thing which I really enjoyed at, uh, at Red Sky was working with the young athletes. So yeah. I really enjoyed, so I was able to, I was involved in sourcing some of their young rugby players and trying to sort of add in to, to helping them. And there's a real sort of, I think there's a real similarity between working in, in so Loretta was an independent school out in Musselburgh and being a pro rugby player is that it's a, it's a proper six day week and you work, you work really hard. Um, but you then have got the benefit of 
of teachers' holidays, which I think for me is is, is going to be and has been so far really just fantastic to spend some real quality time with well the four girls that I've got now and and my wife. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, lockdown. You can look at lockdown many ways, and obviously it's tragic what's going on and the coronavirus coronavirus with with what it's done to families and businesses and all sorts of things. But taking the positives that you can, I might never get nine, ten weeks at home with my family again. You know, that that time is I, I owning my company and holidays when we take them, it's it's valuable time. So when we were here in lockdown and working and doing what we can, I think there's so many people that look at what's actually happened and can try and take the best out of it. You know, because it's, it's yeah, and, and and that was a, a choice for me when I when I've come into the education industry. It's um. It, it doesn't it's not the highest paying industry that, that's out there but it gives you a lot of satisfaction it's it's a really challenging one so i teach um i teach pe academically um and you can go in there and you've you've done one lesson and you think oh you've absolutely nailed it here and then you go in with the same plan and it just doesn't work and it's because you're dealing with people and you're dealing with kids at a certain age where for whatever reason they maybe just just doesn't hit the note with them um so it's a really challenging, it's a really highly, highly rewarding industry to work in. And, and, I, th- and I think it'll just be, it will be, and it has been so far amazing just to have that time with, with our kids because the, um, like the, the, the normal summer is the, not, not a normal summer at the moment, but a normal summer holiday or normal Christmas time with, with your kids is, is really just fantastic. It sure is. I totally agree. Jace, I, wanna, I won't keep you too much longer. I want to wrap up back at Scotland, back in the back row and... Who did you love playing against? If the All Blacks were coming to Murrayfield or South Africa, Australia, what number sixes or back rows would you think this is it? Game day. Um, so New Zealand were were always unbelievably hard, and you couldn't really put your finger on on one thing. They just did everything a little bit quicker, a little bit harder. Um, so yeah, Jerry Collins, Richie McCaw, as, as part of the back row there, the guys coming through from England, Hill back Delario, Delalio. They were that, like playing against that back row. So they were good. So so Lawrence, so it was easy probably to to label like Lawrence was was really vocal. And I because I played so much there in England against him, he was he was full of chat. Um but that was just his his way of doing it and his desire to win. Um and and he gave as good as he got. And then like him and Shabba would go, they would have proper ding dongs, the, the two number eights. But there's a healthy respect afterwards. And like I remember Lawrence Delalio, my first cap against England in 2000 when we won, he came up and, and bought me a beer. And and he's he's proper old school rugby boy, um, Lawrence, and he he's a good egg. Um, and Rich, Richie McCaw, you could just remember smashing him as hard as you could in a ruck. And you've expended so much energy. And you have to really work really hard to get up. And he's already up and he's gone and he's over at the other ruck. And they just, at, at, at times, and at times Scotland probably played a little bit too much respect to New Zealand. But Richie McCaw and some of those boys on their day, they could just, they worked at a level just a little bit higher than us. And we just probably, at certain points in, in the history of Scotland, we've just not been quite as consistent at them. But then again, at times, like we've seen in the recent past, we've, we've got really close to it. Yeah, absolutely. And and how do you think the future of Scottish rugby looks? I think with our with our strongest twenty three outs, and if we if we perform, then then on our day we're we're really good and we're bloody hard to beat. Mm-hmm. But the the frustrating thing is if we're not quite on our money, then then we're a bit too easy to beat sometimes. And that's that's the bit that I would like to see is maybe just close that gap between us at our very best and us at our absolute worst. Let's just close that gap just a little bit. But we've got some brilliant players in there and we've got some world-class, world-class players, um, which is brilliant. And hopefully we'll get back to BT Murrayfield and, and cheering on the boys soon. That's it. Edinburgh, Glasgow, end of August, double header. So that should be good just to get some rugby played. I think it's oh, the boys. Will, the boys will be keen as to get into it. <laughs> Jace, last question: Have you still got your first strip for Scotland? Your first cap strip? I do it's upstairs, hidden away somewhere. Um, yeah, I'm not too. I'm not too big on strips and stuff. I've I've got quite a few strips framed, um, and they're hidden around the house in various places, in cupboards that my wife's put them away in. But yeah. Um, it's funny because it's a strip which is like the old school. It's like a, it's like a square. It's like 
All it's right. like three meters wide by three meters long. And I've got Richard Hill's jersey as well. He he kindly gave me his jersey as he was the number six I played against on my first cap. And his jersey is absolutely it's absolutely massive compared to like now it's all the they're they're fitted, aren't they? They're they're skin tight. Yeah. That's a proper old school that. that's fantastic. Proper yeah. Cotton Oxford, <laughs> ringing wet would add about an extra three or four kilos to your to your body weight. That's it. <laughs> Jace, this has been brilliant. Thanks for uh, for coming on, having a chat, going through the, the career and the, the memories. It's been brilliant. Thank you very much for joining me. Nice, nice one, Nashi. Enjoyed that. Good man. 